developing a sense of agency in IoT systems, preliminary experiments in a smart home scenario. Uh, the speaker is uh, Stefano Mariani. Stefano is a postdoc researcher at the Department of Sciences and Methods for Engineering of the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. He received his PhD in computer science from the University of Bologna, and uh, his research interests include coordination models and languages, agent-oriented technologies, pervasive computing, self-organization mechanisms, and socio-technical systems. So please, uh, Stefano. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I know you hear this sentence many times, but <laughs> it is always good to check. Um, let me see. Okay. Do you see the slides going back and forth also? Yeah, yeah, all is. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm presenting a joint work with my colleagues, Marco Lippi and Franco Zambonelli. Um, well, basically, this is, as the title, subtitle says, uh, preliminary work on this quest toward uh, developing a sort of sense of agency in, in Internet of Things uh, systems. Um, first of all, what is this sense of agency? Well, it's something that's very well known in the field of developmental psychology or cognitive sciences. Uh, it has had some applications also in uh, robotics. And basically, it is the sense that even us as children and infants uh, learn to develop in our first months of life. So uh, the idea of learning to understand uh, what are the actions that we can afford on our environment to affect the environment and what are the perceptions that we can uh, get from our environment. So like a, a child who plays with his hands, touches his, uh, uh, his own face and stuff like that. Um, this is a form of uh, intrinsically motivated exploration. It is somehow driven by curiosity or by some uh, innate sense of, of exploration. Um, so we wanted to apply this to devices and software agents uh, in particular in Internet of Things deployment to let agents build on their own a sort of representation of the world they live in. Um, so basically, we uh, adapted this sort of sense of agency ladder. Uh, we defined it mostly based on literature, but with our own variations, uh, given the, the, the agent-oriented domain. Um, so. Um, what does the letter say is that it says that to fully learn the sense of agency, there are two, let's say, uh, not completely separate, but two perspectives intertwined. Uh, the first is the individual perspective in which we can do perception, exploration or planning. So we can learn to observe variables. Uh, we can learn to do action and try to understand how these actions uh, affect variables. And also, uh, we can try uh, to uh, pursue our own goals based on what we learned about the environment. So uh, these three steps are usually done in a sort of sequence. Mm, even the first two are oftentimes uh, intertwined. Um, the other perspective is the collective one. Um, sooner or later, we recognize that the environment in which we live in uh, is not featuring only us, but there are other agents, or uh, there are uh, the environment own dynamics, like if we are in a physical environment, let's say the weather or the uh, evolution of some sort of natural phenomenon. So at the collective level, we have uh, other three let's say sequential uh, steps we can, uh, we can learn. Uh, the first one is the recognition of non-self. This is the most basic one. When we realize that we are not the only agent acting in an environment. Uh, then there is strategic thinking. 
uh, since there are others populating my environment, I need to try to anticipate their actions if I want to uh, achieve my goal without uh, disruption. Um, and lastly, uh, multi-agent interaction has to deal with the, the fact that for performing some action, I may need the collaboration of others. So uh, these are many things that can be learned uh, either in, isol in isolation or uh, jointly, but to have a full sense, let's say full sense of agency, we need to, to understand and to learn all of them for a software agent. So we tried to do some ex very basic experiment. Uh, we modeled a, a, a very simple agent, which has access to a set of environmental variables, and then can uh, decide to do some actions or doing nothing. Then the agent is free to start doing actions, either randomly or, or uh, looking for all the combinations. And then he, while he is doing these actions on the environment, he uh, observes the, the effects. Uh, this effectively uh, lets the agent build uh, a Bayesian network, for instance, uh, which is also so uh, a network that uh, relates events with other events, but uh, with the addition that this network is only is not only a, a, a correlation, a network of correlations between variables observations, but uh, it can be interpreted as a causal network because uh, some of the variables observed by the agents are on, under control of the agent itself. So some of the V variables that the agent observe uh, are under its control. For instance, because some of the variables are simply a sensory perception, but some other may be action feedbacks stemming from actuator devices. So using this model, modeling, um, the agent has a way to understand that uh, since he did an action on the environment, well, the environment changed in a, in, in a way. Um, under this framework, we can try to uh, let the agent learn some of the steps in the sense of agency ladder we, we have seen before. For instance, he may uh, build a model of the causal relationships uh, linking variables in the observed world. And given this model, uh, he can start planning towards achievement of, of goals by selecting the appropriate set of actions that manipulates the environment variable uh, so that to reach the goal. Um, we want to point out that uh, this is similar, but this is not reinforcement learning. Usually in reinforcement learning, the actions of the agents are... Um, guided by some sort of, the, of reward. And uh, most of the work on reinforcement learning uh, is about uh, exploitation more than exploration. The, the goal is to um, achieve the maximum accumulated rewards on a given task. And you only resort typically to exploration when you are uh, afraid to be stuck on a, in a local minimum. Um, also, usually in reinforcement learning, you don't bother yourself with building a model of the world. You already have some model of the world because you are already able to uh, assign rewards to different actions. Uh, here is that in this sense of agency, uh, which we will see we we implemented as a first prototype, as a first experiment using uh, Bayesian structural learning, uh, is instead driven by curiosity. So there is no external reward to, for the agent. And the goal is uh, explicitly the exploration of the possibilities that the agent has. So understanding how, uh, how the, the, the dynamics of the environment work, OK? There is still work which we believe is related to, to, to what we are doing here, uh, mostly on the side uh, stemming from the literature on causal reasoning. So trying to learn uh, models of 
cause and effect relationship in the in the variables uh, in the observed variables. Uh, in the literature, this is not always related to agents. So here we we take a specific stance that is that of an agent that has, for instance, to as we will see in the experiments, uh, govern a, a smart a smart home uh, Internet of Things deployment. Uh, but there are also other concepts that are some somewhat related to this learning of the sense of urgency. For instance, the notion of auto curriculum is, is, is very related. And also uh, the notion of learning based on intrinsic motivation. I thought most of the works, uh, I would say that uh, do not attempt to build a model of the world. They, they just want to uh, understand which actions are the most, uh, let's say, potentially useful to learn. Uh, when to when to do. Uh, so as I said, we did some preliminary experiment. So we actually uh, we also were interested in actually doing the thing, uh, not only uh, simulating the, the the learning process. So we actually built, uh, well, I would say a, a quite ugly uh, smart home prototype made basically out of cardboard and some uh, Arduino. Uh, Arduino and, and associated sensor and actuator equipment. So basically we have this kind of uh, cardboard house, like a couple of shoe boxes in, inside. And uh, inside that we have some uh, light sensors and some actuators to, uh, let's say, control uh, how the lights uh, are perceived by sensors. Um, this is a more convenient scheme to, to understand the deployment. So we had this kind of two uh, rooms connected by a window. Uh, wherever you see a lightning bolt, there is an actuator. So the window can be controlled. There are light bulbs in each room, which can be controlled by uh, an agent in each room, agent X and agent Y. Uh, there are these sort of electric curtains, which were quite challenging, honestly, to implement in practice, but were basically those little black strips in the uh, at the center, more or less, of the of the picture, and uh, we have some light sensors, and we wanted to play to let the agents play with the with uh, the actuators uh, they have at the disposal, so the light bulbs and uh, the electric curtains, and later on also the window, uh, which is another curtains, as you can see in the picture, it's another black strip, uh, which is uh, actuated by a, a, a stepper motor. And uh, we try to understand which, which steps in the, in the sense of agency ladder we could, we could reproduce. So uh, the very first experiment was uh, the very first batch of experiments, actually, were uh, aimed at the individual perspective on the sense of agency ladder. So uh, here uh, I will only refer to a single room because basically either room you take as a reference is, is the same. They both learn the same things in isolation. So um, in the first experiment, we assume that the, the window between the rooms is closed so they cannot affect each other. They cannot communicate and they have no access to uh, the other room actuators or sensors. Uh, that's why we, we consider a single room for the first, uh, I would say, three experiments. Um, in the first experiment, the light bulbs are not actuable. So uh, we as humans uh, turn the light bulbs on and off. Actually, honestly, uh, another software program turns the light bulbs on and off. And the room can only actuate uh, the curtains. So can only act on the curtains by uh, covering the light or uncovering the light. So basically by acting uh, randomly and trying to understand the effect of closing one curtain only or both curtains uh, when either light is, uh, is, is, is on. Uh, well, the room basically uh, sooner or later discovers that uh, it, can, uh, it can achieve darkness uh, always by closing both curtains. This is one thing that the, the, the agent learns that is, uh, that has the, the, the um, sure effect of always getting darkness because uh, if the light bulbs are off, are turned off, well, actually 
closing the curtains didn't matter, but anyway, the, the luminosity is, uh, is low. We have, in this experiment, we have only two levels for simplicity of luminosity. So either there is light or there is no light, basically. And if the light bulbs are on, uh, either one or both, uh, well, again, by closing both curtains, uh, the agent is sure to achieve to achieve darkness. Uh, this is the very first step of the sense of agency ladder. Basically, here the agent is understanding what is the effect of closing the curtains on the uh, luminosity of the room. Then in a second experiment, uh, we instead let the agent control also the light bulbs. So uh, here we have, let's say, uh, an incremental step in learning. Uh, the, the room agent now learns that uh, it can also achieve darkness while, let's say, saving on efficiency by uh, switching off the light bulbs. So basically here, the agent learns how to push a goal uh, while doing efficient actions, okay? So if I want to achieve darkness and I can control the light bulbs, I can keep the, the, the light bulbs off and then the state of the curtains actually don't matter. Um, instead, if the light bulbs are on, well, if I want darkness in the, in the luminosity sensor placed in the, in the center, I need to shut down both the, both the curtains or the curtain of the, of the light bulb. Um, so this is, let's say, uh, uh, um, a little step further, the, the first experiment. Here we understand uh, the, the agent understands how to act efficiently. When the light bulbs are off, I can also afford to not operate on the curtains. I don't care. Then the last experiment uh, is a bit borderline between the individual and the collective stance on the, on the sense of agency ladder because uh, here we tried another thing. We put uh, a, another source of light. We called it sunlight, but obviously it was another light bulb controlled by, by us, by another software program. And basically here is the, uh, what, the, what the agent learns more is that there are some environmental phenomena for which it has no control. And for instance, here, whether the agent turns off the light bulbs, uh, shuts the curtains, whatever it does, it cannot achieve complete darkness because there is this sort of exogenous phenomena which is outside of its of it control. And this would correspond in our sense of agency ladder to the self and non-self, okay? So the agents recognizes that there is some non-self that uh, hinders its, uh, its quest towards the goal of achieving darkness. Uh, then another batch of experiments instead involved both rooms. So we try to understand in this very simple setting what we can do uh, with the two rooms uh, influencing each other, either on purpose or not. Uh, what, we, what we did so is that uh, now we consider both rooms uh, learn in isolation. So each room learns uh, by observing his own variables and by uh, acting on its own actuators. They do not communicate. Um, this way, when the window uh, is open, uh, the rooms can actually influence each other because there is, uh, they can let uh, the light uh, pass through the other room. Uh, so basically, uh, they can achieve darkness only uh, when the window is closed. And when the window is closed, basically, they have full control on their environment. Uh, instead, when the uh, window is, 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 um, is open, uh, well, they can only achieve darkness if the, if the light bulbs in the other room are, are uh, actually, actually off. Um, sorry, okay. Sorry, uh, I, I was uh, I seen that there was a message in chat, and I, I was thinking it was it was a question. So sorry for this quick switch. Um, so basically, here uh, that both rooms discover that 
uh, if the window is closed, they, they have full control. Otherwise, they, they may not have full control. They need to, to interact with the other room if they want to achieve the goal. And in the last experiment, basically, we let the rooms uh, jointly operate on the window. So the window may open and close only if both rooms decide for uh, opening the window or closing the window. So they, they need to, to agree on the command to send, let's say, to the, to the window. And in this case, uh, eventually the rooms discover that uh, for achieving the goals, either having darkness or having light, whatever the goal is, they need, to, they need to cooperate. They need either to open the window and let the light pass from the other room or close the window and uh, achieve darkness on, on their own. So uh, they learn that uh, they need to uh, jointly act uh, to achieve their, their goal. Uh, all the schemas that I've shown, uh, I forgot to say, but all these schemas that you say uh, on the on the right here and uh, below here are uh, the graphical depiction of the Bayesian network that is learned autonomously by the agents. So as I said, we did structured Bayesian uh, network learning. So we learned not only the uh, nodes in the network, but also the structure of the network. Uh, obviously, there has been some some let's say uh, prior knowledge. Uh, like, for instance, uh, which are the, the actuators that the, the, the agent has at his disposal. So the agent actually does not discover the actuators. He knows, the agent knows that uh, he can act on, on the curtains and uh, whether it can act on the light bulb. Uh, but the, 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 the other nodes in the, in the Bayesian network and the structure of the network is actually uh, learned. Uh, by the agents. All the details are obviously uh, in the full paper. Um, as I said, this was some uh, report on um, these preliminary experiments uh, doing uh, the, um, prepared in, in a lab setting, but with actual equ equipment, so not only in, in simulation. Uh, that's why, for instance, in some of the tables, you can see um, maybe not 100% uh, probability because in, in, in the real environment, even if controlled, there is always some, some noise in, in perceptions. Uh, so basically, even in this very simple setting, uh, we have seen some promising uh, progress towards learning this uh, sense of urgency ladder that we that I presented in the very beginning of the, of the slideshow. Uh, there is the capability of achieving very simple goals, like having darkness, having light. <laughs> and also we can, we observe the signs of um, multi-agent cooperation, like in the, in the latest experiment in which the, the rooms, the agents controlling the two rooms uh, learned to collaborate to achieve, to achieve their goal, either darkness or, or, or light. Um, Obviously, this is a very beginning of the work. Uh, there are many extension points. We mentioned some of them in the, in the paper. Um, one of the first things we want to do is to incorporate some sort, is to try to adopt uh, not classical Bayesian networks, which we interpret as causal Bayesian network, given what I said about the, the agent knowing the, the actuators, but uh, using properly uh, causal networks, causal Bayesian networks. We also want to incorporate some uh, more experiments on uh, not only achieving simple goals, but uh, on planning, uh, for instance, toward achievement of a goal. Here, the setting was very simple. So oftentimes for achieving a goal, the agents only needed to operate on one single uh, actuator, maybe two, but not a very complex, let's say, uh, planning process. And obviously, we also want to confront a bit with some of the related literature we, uh, I show it, especially autocurricula and, and the many forms of intrinsic motivation that we have seen uh, have been, are currently uh, investigated in the literature. Um, well, so many thanks. I think that this concludes my 
my presentation and uh, I'm open to, to questions. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Very interesting uh, study. So, uh, time for question. So maybe I, I can ask you one question. Um, in these uh, experiments that you did, you just uh, have uh, agents, no? So software agents, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, how, how do you think that uh, this uh, model method can be extended to interact with uh, humans? How do you think this interaction between humans and agents can be? Well, um, probably it, it, it depends on which level you want to interact. For instance, even in this model, um, sometimes I mentioned that the, the agents had no control over some of the, of the variables. For instance, in the very first experiment, they cannot switch on and off the light bulbs. They can only act on the, on the curtains. And in that case, uh, who was acting on the light bulbs were obviously uh, another software because we cannot afford to spend all the days turning the lights on and off, but it could have been a, a human being. In, in equally uh, interfering, let's say, with the, or interacting with the with the with the agent learning process. So, uh, I would say that in principle, this model does not care if the one of the if one of the either one of the uh, peers in the agents environments are not software agents but human agents, and uh, if some of the let's say non-self entities that the agent has to deal with is not uh, an, an, um, an environment process, but is a human being, for instance. Because basically the model abstracts from that. So uh, from the perspective of the agents, they don't care what the source of uh, uh, an environmental change is. They just perceive the environmental change and try to relate that change to some action they did. If they do not uh, perform at the action, well, for sure, that was some sort of environmental process. So uh, they, they don't care to some extent if there is another software agent or a human being. Um, having said that, one thing we didn't consider is, well, there are situations in which you want to recognize that you are interacting with a human because there are different humans. And for instance, you want to recognize uh, who you are interacting with. But uh, that's something we, we didn't consider in this very preliminary step. So summarizing, if the, if the human agent is only there to interact with the software agent, like for either for disruption or for making the agent learn and changing the environment in which the agent learns, I would say that the model is okay with that because it, it doesn't really care. <laughs> I don't know if oh. I answered completely to the, to the question the way you expect. <laughs> okay, Pascal has a question. Yes, yeah? so thank you very much for the great talk. Very, very nice. Uh, I also agree that this seems very promising and I, I'm really I'm starting to think right now which which more complex scenarios it would make sense to apply this. Uh, have you thought about this? So so is, I think especially in like if you go to like large scale IoT environments, so so away from the smart home and more like to smart building or even smart city or so. So have you thought about this? Yeah, uh, we started thinking about this. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do is scale this very, very simple example. As I said, it was just two rooms in a shoebox to, yeah. to an actual lab deployment in a, in a let's say, two or three uh, actual rooms. That will be already challenging on its own. But uh, thinking about scaling um, at, at, at a whole city, for instance, or stuff like that, we, 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 we thought about that. And besides, obviously, the technical difficulties, even conceptually, we, we are, in time, we got persuaded that um, we need to look at literature, 
about incremental learning. Uh, I mean, you cannot reduce the whole complexities of both sensing and actuating uh, on a smart city scale without decomposing perceptions and actions into, into smaller items. And yes. you need to, first of all, learn the, the, the very basic primitive atomic actions. Then you must learn how to compose those actions into more complex one. And, and I don't know for how many layers of, let's say, abstraction. And, and you should do the same for perception. So uh, we don't believe that this very simple approach as is can be scaled. We do believe that we will need sooner or later, uh, I don't know the, the, the critical, let's say, uh, mass, where the critical mass will be, but we do think that sooner or later we have to look into this kind of incremental learning uh, literature because, yeah, we, we, we can't actually see how uh, learning these very simple actions can scale to the complexities of not even a city, but just just a, a building or maybe even a whole apartment will be will be too much. Uh, yeah. yeah, very interesting. So it will be very interesting to see how this basically scales with more complexity. So yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have one more question from the audience. Yeah, Usman, I think have a question. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Osman. Uh, I have a question. So uh, I see you talking about agents. Since, um, so is this sort of one of the direction that I see it going towards is sort of like it creating like an agent based model? Is this sort of what you foresee in the future? To well, I mean, here, for instance, we do not take a, a specific uh, agent model or, or, or behavioral model for an agent. What we want to build here is not a model of an agent, but actually we want to build a model of the world where, where the agent lives. So to help the agent understand, okay, what are the actions we can, we can do, uh, I can do, uh, how this environment variable is, is affected by my actions. So, uh, for instance, here we, we just used in these experiments very simple reactive agents. We did, didn't even resort to, uh, I don't know, complex uh, BDI agents or particularly intelligent agents or stuff like that. Uh, because again, here you can use whatever agent architecture you want, basically, because the focus is on building a model, a causal, possibly a causal model of uh, how the agent relates to the world. And this is actually this, this is one of the things that helps shaping the, the sense of agency in, in humans, as, as I would say. When we were children, we, we started understanding, acquiring the sense of agency by trying to understand uh, how we could affect uh, the world. So we have hands, we can touch our face, we can touch an object, we can grab an object and stuff like that. So I would say that this approach doesn't care really much uh, about how the agent is behaving. Uh, he cares much more about uh, the interface between the agent and the environment, so to say. I hope I, I, I have been somewhat clear. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you all.